Um, all right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my goal is today is if by 3 o'clock everybody's still awake, I'm off to a good start. So this will be a good plan. Um, did everybody get a little outline financial issues for seniors and their families? Okay. And did everybody get a tax reference guide? Okay, great. So we're off to a good start. Um, so um, Carla did a great introduction. I will just add to the... Um, to, uh, you know, we, we decided that we wanted to add value back to um, people that we know. And um, the big deal is that um, you can find a lot of information about uh, issues of aging older, aging gracefully um, online, but oftentimes it's very national. And it's oftentimes very much driven by who's paying the money for it. So for example, um, you know, a place for mom is you get to go on, but you've got to ante up some money to be on there. So we recognize that it, 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 with these kind of issues, there's so many local resources that people need to tap into that we really wanted to be a local resource, especially on the North Shore here, north of Boston. We really wanted to be a local resource for you. And so when we're not trying to figure out how to do seminars and how to put our story together, we really share a lot of information back and forth about you know, what services are good, what services aren't good, what services are getting better, what services are getting worse, and so that if anyone touches any one of the eight of us, we have an instant uh, panel of experts that are sitting right there with up-to-date information, because things do change. It doesn't always stay the same. So that's, uh, that's been our main uh, uh, drive. That's been our main mission, and I, th I think it's been going well so far. Um, I, I, I get the pleasure of being able to wrap up the fourth of four seminars. So I just want to get who's already been to the first one. Uh, stay at home. Stay at home. <coughs> and any uh, any uh, feedback? What are your takeaways from staying at home? What was the I don't know top three things you might have taken from that after you um, after you attended it? And feel free to just jump in. This is very informal. It's not a test. <laughs> I assume that people fit had a role in here, right? Um, because fitness is a huge deal, right? Uh, yes, sir. I think the availability of a GCM was important to know about. Yeah, uh, the, so everybody knows what a GCM is, Geriatric Care Manager, which is also now known as an Advanced Life Counseling Manager, ALCM. Did I get that right? Life Care Advocate. Life, uh, so they have various names. They've changed their name recently, so I know it begins with an A, but that's all I remember. Uh, GCM is a very, very important person because if you think of the Patriots, um, the quarterback is Tom Brady. In a senior life, the quarterback is the GCM, Geriatric Care Manager, and that's what Sari uh, who presented that, that was her part. She's one of the key people in our table. Anything else from staying at home that was like memorable that you might have remembered? Yes? Um, the care manager mentioned uh, using local town and uh, resources as far as like getting some help with handling a person who needs uh, constant supervision using like the programs at the senior center that they gave. That's right. I mean, the very first stop before you ever need it is to find out what resources are in your local area. That is like the most, I, I, I try to emphasize that to everybody, the best time to be looking for resources is when you don't need them. That's exactly when you want to do it because you're not under pressure. You don't want to be in a health crisis and trying to find resources. <laughs> it's just the wrong time to do it. You just don't have the time or the bandwidth to do it because you're dealing with other issues. And a lot of, many, many times, unfortunately, probably 80% of the time, it takes a crisis before somebody actually gets started. I encourage you to be disciplined, and we'll talk about this a little bit more afterwards, but I encourage you to be disciplined to line up your resources now. Anything else from the staying at home? Um, I do a lot of work in North Reading. Phil, is, <laughs> Phil knows me from North Reading. He's, uh, Phil Healy is uh, recording our session today, and he's in North Reading. I live in North Reading. Um, Phil, I met him because I did an interview on the Matt Ligor show, which was all about um, aging gracefully in town and what do people want. And uh, North Reading has an exploding population of seniors. We're currently at 25% of our population is uh, seniors going to be 40% in about 10 years. 10 years. But we're, like most communities, we're really focused on the schools. We haven't started thinking about how do we take care of the adults going forward. And so there's a whole initiative going on with that. Um, so anyways, what was my point? The um, uh, point is, is that um, the, the three takeaways that I've learned, because I've done a lot in the senior uh, space through just government and volunteer stuff, is that people want to live in their home as long as they can, they want to live in their community as long as they can, and they want to lead a life of purpose. And those seem to be the three universal truths 
that people, if they hold on to those three things, they have themselves a pretty good life. And I think those are the most compelling things that I'm always focused on. So staying at home is a huge deal. Like anything we can do to stay at home is, is a really, really big deal. I often, you know, because I'm a, a financial advisor, ask people where you want to retire. I often hear, oh, I want to go to Florida. Oh, I want to go to Arizona. And then I sobering, soberingly remind them, where do your kids live? Well, they live here. And where's the best education? Here. And where's the best health care? It's here. Do you really want to go? Like, is that, really, <laughs> is that really a good move, or is it better to stay at home? Um, personally, you know, Phil's heard this. Sorry, Phil, I have to repeat it again. Um, I'm all in. I'm staying, I'm staying in North Reading. I'm gonna, I plan to live in my house for as long as I possibly can. And when I'm done living there, I plan to live in my town, and that's why I'm working so hard to make resources. We don't have resources right now for somebody like me who's going to need those kind of resources, so I'm working really hard to make that happen. All right, move from home. Move from home isn't always a bad idea. You're just changing your homes. Anybody remember anything from that? You can look inside your sheets if you just want to remind yourself. Any move from home ideas? So the big deal about that is you're going to a new situation. You don't know where you're going, right? It's like um, I think it's a good idea to move my, out of my home, but you might be going to a condo, a townhouse, you might be going to a, a independent living, a lot of different situations you might be going into. Um, you know, is that going to be a good fit? And I always ask, whenever I talk to somebody who's considering doing that, I'm always like, consider you're going to college. If you're going to go to college, what would you do? What would you do? If you're sending your grandchildren to college, what do you tell them, tell them to do? Or what do they do? Go on tour. Go on tour. Go visit, go knock on the doors, go visit with people right there, go see what's going on. It's the most practical way to understand what's going on is just go visit and see what's going on. It opens your eyes, and there's almost no one who won't tell you what's going on. You can learn so much just by going and taking a tour. It's like the number one thing, I think, if you're thinking about leaving home to do. Um, legal review. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but um, I know it's very thick, everything else like that. Any impressions from the legal review? Get an irrevocable trust. Okay, there's, there's reasons to get into irrevocable trust. Yeah, there's reasons to do that. Um, probably what he said was get a trust, and why did he say get a trust? Forget about revocable or irre irrevocable. Why did he uh, say get a trust? To get yourself or your um, heirs out of probing. That's it. That's exactly, thank you. Hey, star, star. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, dealing with, you know, I don't know where you live, but if you have to go down to the middle sex uh, courthouse, um, if you have to go down there to do probate, it's awful. It's an awful experience. They're not very well organized. It's a very archaic system. You're doing everybody a world of good to plan ahead and to get your documents in order. And a trust makes that happen very, very well. Um, I, again, I'm going to talk later about an article I'm writing specifically on this topic. But um, you know Amy Winehouse? <coughs> no will. No trust. I know, I know the initial reports, but she really did a good job. Actually, as it turned out, she did a really bad job. She didn't do it. Uh, who's the fellow from Soprano? Um, it's an Italian name. Uh, well, uh, Gandolfino? What is it? Um, it was Gandolfi. James Gandolfi. That's it. Yeah. Also, it just here's the IRS. Just give my estate over to the IRS. That's basically what they did. They shoveled like $30, $40 million. <laughs> Aretha Franklin also didn't do it, you know, didn't really plan ahead, you know, didn't plan ahead. Prince, you know, there's, I think there's settled a lot of things, but they have half-sisters, half-brothers, they had a lot of issues going on, and, you know, I, I don't know how many millions he had, but he had a lot. But how about Steve Jobs? Never heard a word, right? He did it all. Trust. He had it all set up ahead of time, privately, quickly, quietly. No one ever heard about it because it was all done properly. He did it all ahead of time, which is a really good thing. All right, um, I handed you a uh, tax uh, update just because the tax laws have changed. Just trying to make it so you just were aware. We don't, we're not going to cover anything in there. And then um, who am I? So I'm Rich Walner. I've been, um, uh, I've been in financial services for 10 years. I was independent for nine and a half of that, um, meaning I was working on my own out of North Reading. Um, I come from my world from a holistic financial planning point of view, which is I look at all aspects of your life, not just <coughs> your finances, not just the money. I look at everything and then make it all tie together. And um, prior to that, I was in corporate life for 25 years doing a variety of different jobs. So I've had a lot of different experiences. 
Um, but it was my own experience as a consumer, which wasn't great, of the financial services world that compelled me to join the financial services world, because once I woke up and realized how I was being treated, I suddenly have a, a different view of how the world should work. And I'm, so I'm a financial cynic, to be honest. I'm really uh, very cynical about the very profession I represent. Um, and then uh, I put just, you know, if you need to, I'm on the back side. My information is on the back there. If you, you just need to get a hold of me, I won't bring this up again. But, um, you know, there's my phone, my email address. And then if you want to just, um, if it's easy for you, you have a smartphone, you can just text in 41411 and then just uh, text uh, and then type in USA 500 R wall and all my contact information will appear on your phone. Super easy. Okay, so I'm Rich Walner. All right, um, how many here have officially retired? Everybody looks so young, I just can't tell. Let me ask the opposite, who hasn't retired? We got two, three, okay, great. Um, and who feels very confident about their understanding and knowledge of personal financial issues? Okay, all right, good, okay. I do because my husband's a CPA. Oh, well then you're in really good shape. And that leads me to my next question. How many people already have financial advisors in place? Oh, good. Oh, good. So you've, uh, a number of you have already, uh, have already talked to a number of people. That's really good. Fantastic. Um, and uh, how many have family members that we trust? Okay, we're about half. That's about normal. Um, life is a lot easier if you have family members you can trust. It's a little bit harder if you don't. So when you're doing the legal review part, you know, hopefully you heard that it's easier to do it with people you trust. It's a little bit harder and you have to do a little bit more planning if you unfortunately don't have someone you can trust in your family. It makes it a little bit more difficult, but not impossible. All right, so, you know, we have various levels. I hate to erase this. This is just like the worst thing. They let me use a whiteboard and I hate to just... Never do it again. Think, think. She said she'll recreate. All right, don't hold it against me. Um, I just wanted to get from you, do you have any big expectations, you know, what did you hope to cover, you know, we're probably thinking more globally right now than anything else, but is there anything in particular you really wanted to cover, and I've already given you an outline, so we may cover it already, but is there anything that's just top of mind, things you're thinking about, we're not, we're just going to take a minute to do this, so anybody, yes? How to leave money to grandchildren versus children. Yeah, you should be. Okay. And that would be too. How often? It requires lots of thought. It can be very effective, but it requires lots of thought. How often should you review what you put down? In oh, good point. Uh, statements. Okay. Ensuring that you don't outlive your money. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm aware of that, but an expert might have some better advice than what my mind is telling me. You won't, is what my mind is telling me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, hope we got that on film. <laughs> uh, okay, hold on one second. It's all right. Yeah, the world is good. I must have hit something. All right, sorry. Thank you, Phil. No worries. All right, let's try that again. All right, we'll not outlive. And what was, I'm sorry, an another one? Oh, anybody else? No? Okay. We're, this will be an add-on. This will be an add-on. And that one I'm definitely going to cover. So at least we'll hit your main issues uh, going forward. All right, so um, I'm going to go fairly brief. I'm happy to take questions. If for some reason I hit an issue that's going to be too deep or too uh, involved, I'll just ask you to write down, and you can always pick up it again later. Um, so try to address the broader audience, but um, I'll do what I can. You know, I try to answer questions pretty quick. I never consider myself an expert in anything. I always look up my answers, but if I know what I'm going to tell you, if I don't know, I'm going to look it up and get back to you. So uh, we'll go from there. All right. Um, so uh, so retiring, right? Let's get right to it. We we're talking about you know how your cash. You don't want to outlive your assets. It's basically the bottom line. So really, 
the main message is, especially in retirement, is cash flow is king. Same for a business, actually. But cash flow is definitely king. You gotta have the cash flow to be able to support your lifestyle. And everybody's dedicated to the lifestyle. So the question I would ask is, who has a budget? Okay, about a third. Yeah, so we do or we don't. Um, I would encourage uh, you all to, um, if you haven't gone through the discipline of trying to create a budget, I would definitely encourage you to do so. I mean, if you have so much money, you don't have to think about it, great. Um, but we are living longer and longer and longer. People are living well in their 90s, routinely. You know, my dad did not uh, take care of himself very well at all, and he died at 90. You know, so it, it's amazing to me that that even happened. So um, you need to know your numbers. If you really want to get in control, if you really want to get a leg up on making sure you don't run out of assets, you really have to get, figure out what your budget is because if you don't know that number, it can really get out of control. Now, there's easy ways to do it, right? There's complicated ways to do it, but there's some easy ways to do it. Mint.com is one resource you can go to where a lot of people, young and old, and in between, uh, go to and they create their budgets online. And uh, it's a simple way. Mint, I wrote it right down for you. Oh. www.mint.com. Oh, Mint. Mint. Yep. That's one of them. There's, there's other ones like that. So if you did a Google search, I'm assuming everybody can yeah. get access to a computer if nothing else. Uh, look up some sort of online resource for yourself. I, th I believe in this case you can link your banking account to it, and it will give you all the um, information you could possibly be looking for. So you're not entering in by hand because you don't want to... You know, you don't want to enter it in by hand, right? It's just, it's just too painful to do it. The important thing to do is understand. And whenever I ask anybody to do this exercise and they haven't done it before, suddenly, like in my world, it's like, wow, I didn't realize I was spending $1,000 a month to go out for dinner. Yeah. It's a lot of money, right? It's like, you know, you start thinking a little bit harder. It doesn't take long <laughs> to rack up $1,000 of entertainment money. I'm not saying you shouldn't go out. I'm saying you should be aware. That's all I'm saying. You should know. And then when you're doing your... Um, when you're doing your budget, you really want to separate out between <coughs> fixed living expenses and discretionary. So non-discretionary and discretionary. So non-discretionary is I got to turn on the lights, I got to eat my food, got to insure the car. All those things are essential items that you should know. And then the other category is travel, entertainment, having fun, gifts, anything like that. You should, you should have a, a general awareness about what's going on in that, in that case. Um, the wild cards that are really hard to anticipate you know, what's the, what, what can throw my budget off? Well, if you have a health care crisis, that could definitely throw your budget off, right? I mean, that's hard to anticipate. You know, keep exercising out here, and I fully believe you're going to do very, very well. You know, fitness is everything as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I know that people, you, you get that notice from Social Security, the future Social Security looks, you know, like maybe we'll only be able to pay out 75% of it in 10 years, there aren't many people who really believe that's going to happen who are in the know. Um, that's a actually relatively easy fix uh, for the government to take on. But long-term care is a huge, huge issue. It's the um, number one issue in Massachusetts and most states is that, you know, the Mass Health Medicare uh, budget is just going through the roof. I mean, it's like a real budget buster. I, you know, at some point there's going to be an end point on that one. So long-term care is a big deal. And again, that comes back to when you're starting to think about housing, where you end up, and we'll talk about that, where you end up or where you want to end up can very much affect how this long-term care number is being affected. Uh, Social Security, um, for those who haven't retired, have you clicked on your Social Security yet? You have. Anybody not clicked on their Social Security yet? Everybody's turned on their Social Security. Okay. You haven't? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I thought you meant clicked on the website. Just oh, no, no, no. Have you flipped the switch no. to turn on the thing? No. Okay. Do you know the best age to do it? Yes. The older the better. The older the better. If you can go to 70, that's the best time because the difference between probably a full retirement age of 66-ish and 70 is like a 32% bump in, uh, in payback. And uh, you'll make up for that. You'll hit break even about seven years in. Yes? That's one of those questions where the answer is obvious if you know how long you're going to live. Yeah, that's, yeah. We never know. So how do we get a clue about how long we're going to live? Well, you can look at actuarial numbers. Yeah, uh, yes, you can start there. I, I, look at, I look at lifestyle, and what I always ask is, where's your mom, where's your dad? You know, how long do they live for? What's your family situation look like? When you know those numbers, usually you have a pretty good guess. 
So I think that, you know, based on my dad's experience, so my dad was 90, my grandmother died in 99. You know, I had another grandfather who died relatively young, but you know, if I look at it, I have longevity in my, in my, um, in my family more than likely, and I take care of myself, I, you know, exercise and everything. I exercise, I've always exercised. More than likely, I'm gonna live long, I'm planning for 70. You know, but you're right, I mean, you could get caught. <laughs> You never know, but it's the best guess. And it only takes six or seven years to make up to the break even before then you're winning, basically. Rich, yes. once you kick on your Social Security, yes. um, is there, are there still upper limits as far as what you can go out and earn as an individual? Uh, it depends on when you turn it on. Okay. So if you turn it on between 62 <laughs> and 66-ish, mm -hmm. 67, uh, money you make, it will, they will take it away from you. So it's, I think it's two for one or so. I forget what exactly what age, but they will take away money from you. They won't give you as much benefit. After, once you hit full, full retirement age, which is the 66-ish number, then you can work as much as you want and it has no impact on your social security. So you could go out and earn millions of dollars. Absolutely. I used to work for a millionaire and I remember when he flipped his social security on, I was like, now I'm working for you twice. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I'm working for you here and I'm also paying social security for you to, make money and he was making more money than you can ever imagine you know so um, yes you can once you hit full retirement age or the definition is full retirement age and that's for me it's like I think I'm like 66 and nine months or something like that it's the FR right that's how they refer to it on the Social Security website if you I know they get a statement around your birthday but you can always go online it's actually has become a very nice website very easy to find things information just just for your knowledge um, and how else can we affect our cash flow? Employment, right? Staying employed, staying relevant. I, again, life of purpose, right? Life of purpose is, you know, you want to be doing something that has meaning. So my group in town, uh, I have a group called ACT. It stands for Advocates for Adults, Community, and Teen. And I have like about 20 people on there. Everybody is, uh, almost everybody is older. And um, we're going to have seniors serving seniors. We're going to have older people serving older people and they want to stay relevant just by volunteering so i put down employment from a income point of view but if you happen to be financially independent you know staying relevant just volunteering being busy is a very healthy thing to do it's actually one of the most important things if you look at longevity studies we have the mit age lab has anybody ever heard of that uh it's it's unbelievable the research they're doing and um you know it's like if you put these factors together in your community being relevant, uh, doing your fitness, you're going to have a happy, happy and long life. And that's, you know, what good's a long life if you're not happy? Um, and then reverse mortgages. I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. I hope reverse mortgages should be considered a last resort. Um, I had a client in Somerville whose husband had set her up meaningfully well. He knew he was going to pass. Set her up meaningfully well in a, in a um, reverse mortgage. And actually, based on their income, there was no reason to do it, but he did it anyways. By the time I got in there, we, she had collected $80,000 in income, but to pay it off, it was going to cost her $280,000. That's how much the interest was. And right now, she's, wasted, you know, she's wasting away a $1.5 million home in Cambridge. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, and that was within like five years. I mean, it was unbelievable how aggressive it can be. So, you know, reverse mortgages, you know. <laughs> No, 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 um, you know, without like a really lot of thought, you know, definitely people who have financial advisors, that would be a big one for you to think about. All right, so what's the opposite of cash flow? What's the enemy of cash flow? Yeah. Debt, yeah. right? Debt is, will put in a big anchor on everything we're trying to do. We got to get rid of debt as much as possible. So why did I put down student loans? Grandchildren. Yes. I mean, I have people who are ready to retire who I start going through everything they go, go on, and they go, yeah, my kids have, you know, all these school loans. And I go, like, how much? Well, I got a 50 over here, 100 over here, 300 over here. Well, that is now your liability because you co-signed, right? Yes, I did. What do you mean it's my liability? You co-signed. It, it, the, the government will not let you off of paying back that loan. They're either going after the student or they're going after the, the co-signer. That is a debt and it is an anchor on your retirement. So for people especially who are pre-retirement, uh, they need to be aware of that. And many, many times they have absolutely no idea that's the connection. You know, you just, 
you're not going to get away with um, not paying that loan back. It's like the IRS. If you owe money to the IRS, you've got to pay it. Same as the government. You've got to pay that money. So student loans is a big deal. Hopefully you don't have that issue. Credit cards, of course, you know, I mean, you've all been around. Interest rates are absolutely ludicrous. Um, yeah, I know you can get low interest ones, but eventually they end up very high. Those are really bad to have. HELOCs are home equity line of credits. They were a little bit more advantageous up until this year with the tax law changes. Now with the tax law changes, um, the ability to write them off on Schedule A itemized deductions has almost largely disappeared. I'm not saying you couldn't put it down and hope it works, but <laughs> you, if they ever came back and asked you what's going on, if it isn't directly related to improving your house and you can prove it, it's not a, it's not a write-off situation. So that's just something to keep in mind. It used to be much more liberal before. You could use it for all your consumer stuff. Now, <coughs> now you can. But if you've used it for home improvement. You're good. Okay, good. You're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're good. And then, of course, the mortgage. You know, and, okay, I'm a financial advisor. How many people have said don't pay off your mortgage, right? I mean, just let it run, right? You've heard that probably a million times. I'm going to tell you, for peace of mind, if you want to pay off your mortgage, pay off your mortgage. It's peace of mind. To me, it frees you up. And I'm a financial advisor. I know it makes, I can, on a piece of paper, I can prove exactly what they're saying, why they say what they say. But we need to be happy. And if being happy means getting rid of your debt and freeing up your cash flow, I strongly encourage you to do that. I mean, as, you know, people who have, you know, I have younger kids, you know, if I'm working for somebody and all of a sudden they say your job is at risk, all the debt I've accumulated suddenly becomes this huge, huge anchor on my life that I'd rather not have. And so it's better, you know, I've always been as much as possible debt free. I have no debt even at a very young age. I've always been that way. And the fellow I mentioned, uh, the guy I used to work for who died a billionaire, he was like zero debt. He paid everything out of pocket. He always had a choice. No matter what bad, no matter whatever bad happened, he always had a choice about what to do. Your financial advisors will say something else. I'm not arguing on an academic level. It's peace of mind. To me, that's a huge, huge deal. Anything else about debt? Does everybody know what, if you had to pay off debt, which ones to pay off first? The highest interest. Highest interest. Logical, right? Do you know what everybody pays off? The one that has the lowest uh, amount due because they just want to get it done. They want to check it off. Um, you really want to go for the highest interest ones first and the ball will roll back your way. But again, if mentally, you know, if you're more motivated to take care of the little ones, even if it doesn't make sense on interest-wise, do what makes you happy. You know, I mean, it's, just, you know, you, money isn't, money shouldn't be a de totally deterrent on your life, you know. If it makes you happy, go for it. But almost everybody pays the small amount due, and they forget that it's really the interest that defines it. It's really strange to me. Um, okay, any questions about that? Again, I'm going through this pretty quick, so um, feel free to raise your hand. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was trying to hold back, but <laughs> mortgage. Uh oh. Mortgage <laughs> Let me get behind debt. the table. <laughs> <laughs> so my financial advisor. Yes. Who may have led me in the wrong direction, much like my lawyer at the last session, <laughs> um, said that mortgage interest can be advantageous at retirement. Um, well, only if, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any <coughs> circumstance I can think of. It depends on your, because uh, the tax laws have all changed, yes. and the itemized deductions is going to be a lot less available to people than it was before. The hurdle's a lot higher. So in the past, interest deductions were always good to have on Schedule A. It reduced down, if you got over the standard deduction, it reduced down how much you owed. But you do you have a CPA? Do you have an accountant? I do. Okay. So what you would do is saying... I'm thinking about changing this, run my numbers based on new, new numbers for this year, and tell me, is there any advantage or disadvantage of doing that? Um, it's almost, you have to go to your, I mean, that's what I say to everybody, is they have the software to be able to figure that out. Go to them, ask them to run this scenario. For them, it's one minute. I mean, it's just plugging in a number. You know, they have all those, anybody with reasonable software would have that, and they can tell you the advantages or disadvantages of doing that, because it's become so, so complicated. You know, it's become very complicated. So I, only if you do the math will you know for sure. Right. Yeah, it may mean nothing. It, the mortgage interest may mean nothing anymore because the standard deduction could just be wiping it out anyway. So then you're making that decision for a different reason. 
Does that help? Well, yes. Thank yeah. You. Good. Yes. I just wanted to say that there's a difference between a CPA and an accountant. Uh, uh, Some people have an accountant shingle out, but they're not specialized. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the uh, level of study for the CPA is significantly greater, and you have to get to continuing ed credits. You have right. to stay up on the game. You can't just be. Uh, um, Nothing wrong with accountants, but uh, CPAs are a higher level <coughs> person. Is your husband? Yes. A CPA? CPA. Yeah. Uh, still Specializing practicing? In taxation. What's that? Specializing in taxation. Oh, good. Have you learned a lot of things along the way? Or? <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> it's good. I actually, uh, you know what, I, again, I kind of woke up after my corporate job. I used to, you know, I went to H&R Block first. This is many, many years ago. I'm older. Um, 60. Um, and uh, I went to H&R Block, and I, you know, the first year I had them do is I didn't have a clue what doing taxes was all about. And then I went, I just decided to just get some publications and read through them. Like, can you imagine reading through tax publications? I mean, it's like weird. And then I found all these deductions they missed, and I was really upset. So I did my own taxes for years and years. You know, I'd be waiting for, right between the holidays, you know, you'd get your, right at New Year's, right, right after Christmas, you'd get your package. And I'd be digging through it and figuring it all out. But it's good to understand taxes. It's really good to understand it because uh, that's where our world moves. Um, it changes so often. Oh, this last change has been really has thrown me for a whirlwind. You know, it's really hard to keep up. So I give you credit for digging in. It's really important to know. It's actually one of the most important things to know is how the taxes work, even though it's very complicated. And they can't do it without software. Well, even the simple thing of if you think you're donating clothes and or the charity, your deduction, you have to now have $24,000 worth of deductions before it even matters. Before it even matters, right. So how many people have $24,000 in deductions and charitable contributions? Yeah. So if you're really focused on that, you have to know the numbers, and then you, you gang up. Uh, okay, I'm going to do it all this year and not do it for the next two years. You know what I mean? Like you don't spread it out, which is kind of like a little unfortunate. But um, by the way, those things all sunset. So it's only until 2025, and then we're back to, so theoretically back to where we were. Except the companies have permanent deductions. The rest of us, we got till 2025, and then we're back to where we were before. So don't lose track of where we were. <laughs> yes, sir. I we came in late, but have you uh, talked about the effect this year in the tax of the $10,000 deductions that you could take in taxes uh, this year because of the new tax law? Have I talked about that? Yeah. Only just just briefly to say that um, you know it's probably going to have an effect on your your Absolutely. return. But if you really want a good estimate of that, I would go to your accountant, your CPA. They more than likely, especially a CPA would have software where they could plug in the numbers for you and give you a projection. They, they, they're able to estimate. Of course, you already know. Oh, OK. Well, is it good or bad? Not good. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. So then you got to do a little strategy planning on, you know, for your taxes if you potentially can. Loading up, uh, you know, if you're planning to give away money, loading up money or you know, loading up charity type things. You know, there's sometimes workarounds. Sometimes they're just not. Sometimes you just, it is what it is. It is. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes? What do you think about the online taxes, like, if you do yourself? I've never done that, but TurboTax? Turbo TurboTax. Turbo yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, well, so right now, okay, so this is a good question. I, um, I, because my wife has a business and, you know, we got to do partnerships and all that other stuff. So I do all the QuickBooks and everything else like that, but um, I've handed all that all off to my accountant and any accountant, CPA, CPA, will, um, will have the software. They do it all electronically. For a long time, I did, when I was doing it myself, I was figuring I don't want to get audited, so I would gladly do it manually because I never wanted them to come look over my back and it was a lot easier to audit an electronic file than it is to audit a manual file. That was just my paranoia. <laughs> um, I think now, I think it's fine to do it online. I would, for confidentiality reasons, for you know security, I would start at the IRS and find out who they have kind of appointed their people <coughs> because there's you know the level of security and everything else like that. The IRS has had a good record, but they've had a lot of fraud. Uh, uh, refunds and things like that. So I would use that as my starting point. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So I, my thing is, you know, it's dynamic. So I, uh, at the beginning of the year, I would go to IRS and find out who is kind of their approved um, people. And I think that's a good start. But for people who use, um, it's not QuickBooks, it's, it's uh, 
That's the business side. What's what do people? Is it QuickBooks? TurboTax. Yeah, I mean they keep building their file, you know, over the years. So you don't have to keep repeating things, which is also has much value, and I can't argue with. It. I think it's really convenient. I'm thinking of going back myself. It's the way I used to do it. Read publications, right? Okay. Uh, let's take on the role of fixed income. So what is the role of fixed income? Social Security is a fixed income, right? We may have other fixed income. Could be interest, could be dividends. Um, people have sometimes income annuities, pensions. Anybody have pensions? Income annuities? Yeah, a few. Pensions and income annuities are basically, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're the same thing. They're, they're basically, it's an annuitized lump sum, however that lump sum occurs. That's paid out regularly. Yes, do you have a question? I was going to say, no, um, RMDs require a minimum distribution from IRAs. Because I was self employed, so my retirement money is all in an IRA. Yeah, that's, that's under the investment side, so okay. probably under investments, yeah. But it, it, it's sort of fixed in that I have to take it. You have to take it, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah, that's an interesting wrinkle. We'll come up with yeah. that. Just hold on to that sure. one second, I'll, I'll get to that. So, um, what is the role of fixed income? So. The goal is, is, when I talked about budgets before, we talk about discretionary versus not discretionary. If you don't want to run out of money, try to have it as much as possible that your fixed income equals your non-discretionary expenses. That's kind of where you want to be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So everything that, flip my lights, you know, drive the car, all those things largely should be covered by your fixed income because that's guaranteed money, to, almost always guaranteed money that's coming to you month after month for the rest of your life. If we have that under control, then you can use whatever money else you have for your non-discretionary um, expenses, and then you know your budget. So this is a smart way of looking at your budget. That's why I say divide it in two. To me, fixed income equals <coughs> your non-discretionary expenses, if you want to tie those two together. Okay. Fixed income will never, probably never beat inflation. It's not there to do that. It's not, it's not its goal is to beat inflation. Its goal is to pay your living expenses so you never run out of money. Except, that, I'm sorry, yeah. except your non-discretionary needs will grow over time. Yes. Right? Electricity bills go up, fuel costs. That's right. Uh, yes. Uh, so we hope Social Security does a lot of its job. <laughs> but where do, we, where do we account for inflation? Right, because fixed income is almost, by definition, always a little bit behind the inflation curve. It's just the way it's set up. You know, unless you were able to pick early, you know, like Social Security does give you a little bump on the consumer price index, all that other stuff. But, you know, sometimes on your pensions, they, they may track it if you're lucky. You know, sometimes the income annuities may have an inflation rider inside it. You know, but you would have had to pick it early because once you flip that switch, there's no going back. They don't let you second guess that because actuarial rates kick in and all that other stuff. So um, that's the goal is to have fixed income cover your primary expenses. Now we go to investments because investments in general are your inflation at least matchers, if not beaters, right? Those are the, that's the place where, you know, you're hoping your investments way out distance the market. I mean, way out distance the uh, inflation rate. And, you know, if you've been in the market... <coughs> You've had a good run of eight, nine years, right? It's been a really good run as far as that's concerned. Uh, we're probably more than likely, just having sit through this long meeting yesterday, probably more than likely investments, you know, in the next six months to 12 to 18 months, there's going to be a slowdown. The brakes are coming on <coughs> as the interest rates are going up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people are saying we're going to be around the peaks of like 1% to 2% for a good chunk of time. So, you know, this is where the interest rates start to increase. Inflation rate increases, and your investments may not be doing quite as much as they were doing before. So, you know, uh, do we have a slowdown coming? Probably, more than likely. Does anybody know for sure? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. People wanted to jump off three years ago, right? Four years ago. They thought it couldn't get any better, and it has. So you just never know what's going to go on. And interestingly, people always ask about, like, is the uh, midterm elections going to affect this? It seems like the market and the, and the government are really disconnected. It almost seems to be, the news seems to be immune from what the business community is doing. That's just my observation. I'm not saying there's not little bumps. There are bumps. You know, um, uh, when the presidential election happened, suddenly there was a big spike, and then within a few days it corrected. Um, so, you know, I, but I really fully believe it's almost separate. 
they almost act independently of each other, even if there is a little bit of emotion that's going on. Um, okay, the, the re, the, if you haven't, if you're largely living off of investments, RMDs, things of that nature, you know, what, we're talking very broad strokes, you probably already know this, I'm sorry to repeat it, you know, there's passive investing and then there's active investing. Passive investing is, we can think of like the Vanguard model, very low fees, indexed, you know, they, they find indexes, sectors, the most common being the S&P, and they throw no management into it. It's really just tracking the, what the S&P does, and they keep the fees really low. I think it's like at 0.05% or something like that. It's very low, but there's no management going on. And the opposite side is active investors, managers, you know, wealth managers, firms, you know, BNY Mellon might be a common one you might think of. They're heavily involved in managing the assets, anticipating trends, doing things of that nature. And the goal is you like to think that with the fees on the active management side that the returns would justify their existence versus passive, which has very low fees, but it's just tracking the market. You know, the results over the eight, nine years has largely been the passives have won, largely. The anticipation is that the actives are going to win going forward because we're in for vol volatility. If you look back very long, though, and again, I'm talking very high-level type stuff, what I've seen is the charts show, you know, passive wins and goes down. And active is down and goes up. They basically, they just do one of these things. They just sail across each other. So it's just a matter of are you on the right cycle? Um, you know, I think there's a reasonable need to be active and get ahead of trends at this point in our existence. But I think over the last nine years, it's been great. It's been largely great to be in the, um, in the passive market, just as we have just a little overview. Um, the 4% myth, does anybody know what that is? Uh, go ahead, yes. Got all the answers. Well, I didn't see you. Oh. My financial yes. advisor um, told me pulling 4% uh, out um, was what I should be doing because I'm locked into annuities, TIA crap. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. So you're having that type right. of thing going on. So, yeah. Uh, there's a little, you know, the four percent. So what she's saying is that if you take out four percent of your principal every year, you can have a used to be the number was something like I think over 25 years, you'd have like a 99 percent chance of not running out of money by the end, which has been your <laughs> main point, right? Um, that number has been tempered down to around 3.3, 3.4. So that 4%, that's why I put down a myth here, that old rule of thumb has become old. So it's not quite as simple as that anymore. And it requires caution. And so if you're with, I think Tia Kraft has the capabilities, they can do Monte Carlos for you. Do you know what Monte Carlos are? If I roll the dice a thousand times in all these different market scenarios, I keep rolling it and I do it a thousand times, what's the probability that I'll win, what's the probability I'll lose, and what's the limit? <coughs> and you need to know, you kind of need to know that range. It's one way of looking at it, it's a very common way, it's a good way of understanding, it's very scientific, and it's probably true. You never know the, the, the future, but it's a good way of like trying to figure out how that works. But oftentimes, if you do the 4% versus 3.4%, the results are, you know, what's the probability? Not 99% anymore. Wow. So uh, just, you know, just something you, if, you, if you're operating under that mode, you'll want to dig in a little deeper on that, okay? Uh, sequence of returns. <coughs> I got lucky. My son just went off to college. Um, I dumped, because of the job I had before, I made a lot of money. I dumped a ton of money into the 529s. It didn't do anything for a long time, because that was 2000, right? It was a tech bus bubble. And then, you know, we had the, uh, the 2007, 2008. So my things got beat up. All of a sudden, you know, it's really like sailed. And I'm at the peak of the market. My son is going to school thanks to the market pumping up. Sequence of returns. Now, if he had gone four years ago, loans. We'd be doing loans all over the place. But it's just sequence of returns. So what's the point of that? You can't control when the money is going to be available or when you need it, right? It is what it is. Um, the important thing is to try to not put all your eggs in one basket. We've heard this a million times. Have money over here. Have money over here. Have money over here. So I have maybe something in my Roth. Maybe I have some stuff in my IRA. Maybe I have some money in just brokerage accounts. And every year, with the help of your CPA, you can go through 
good CPA will at the end of the year look at what's going on, what's going on with your investments, how can we tax harvest, losses against gains. You know, there's a lot of things we can do to make our lives smoother. And if I take it out of this bucket, I'll avoid this bracket. If I take it out of this bucket, I'm gonna be in a second bracket up higher. So there's a lot of things you can do to play, but it's all about having them in different buckets and utilizing them properly. And that just requires thought and some coordination with your, your, your accountant, your CPA, if they have the capability to be able to do that. Or your financial advisor. Many financial advisors have those tools, but they can help you to plan ahead, right? But the important thing is to try to have as many buckets as possible. That's tax efficiency. Um, you said RMDs, right? Right. Yeah, nothing we can do about those. Um, they just come when they come. You get a number and you gotta take care of them, right? Um, does everybody know how that kind of charts? I and what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. With the IRIS, um, so the government is always waiting to get their money. So they, you know, the factors of three, you can, like if when you're working, you can set aside money pre-tax. They can grow tax deferred, but at the end, IRS is waiting to get paid. That's what a required minimum distribution is. So if you're doing a 401k that can divert to an IRA or if you do an IRA, there always is, when you hit 70 and a half at the latest, you have to start doing required minimum distributions. And they have a whole schedule. And it really peaks, it, it ramps up really quick when you're younger, and then it tails off really quick. So they're really trying to hit you as fast as you possibly can. Well, but you die young. Uh, and they want to get their money. It's, they're still going to get their money, but they, they yeah. you know, it, it, you could potentially stretch it, which is a whole other technique. But uh, Where can you find those schedules? In, um, on any, you go to Charles Schwab, I saw it the other day. Oh, okay. Go to Charles Schwab, throw in your numbers, they'll tell you the RMD schedule, okay. where you are. It's really, any, you know, Fidelity would have it, any, I'm, I'm sure Tia Kreff has it, any calculator. Uh, hey, a good calculator for, this is going to sound bad, but a good calculator for going online for finding almost any financial stuff, I use it all the time, it's called Dinky Town. Dinkytown.com. They have calculators coming out of their ears. They're very easy to use. Dinky, D-I-N-K-Y, town, T-O-W-N, dot com. It's great calculators um, if you don't want to go to some financial institution. Yes? Um, when you have an IRA, and some people say that a week too long, how do you determine if it's something you should do? Yeah, that, that would be a, another calculator that you would go to a financial advisor about. I have, like, in my arsenal, I have like, here's your situation. I put in all these numbers and then we calculate out whether or not it makes sense to switch to a Roth or not. Um, in general, in general, because everybody's situation is different, the worst time to do is when it's in a peak market, peak market like we are right now. The best time to have converted an IRA to a Roth would have been in 2007, 2008, because everything was very low. So, because what has to happen is when you convert, you got to pay your taxes. And so you have to have that money to be able to pay your taxes. Right now, we're in an opposite environment where it's, you'd be paying the most taxes possible. So, you know, again, you can do the calculators, and that's practically the only way you can do it. And I think Dinky Town has a calculator. So you can try to, isn't that a funny name? Uh, I love it, it's, it's so cool. Can't forget. Um, you can also go to them and see if they have it, but that would be a calculation that you'd want to figure out. Probably wouldn't be so common right now. Anything else about, again, investments we could talk for days and years and weeks. On the IRA, can you take more than? Yes, you can absolutely take more. Government would be happy to get paid. Can you just pay the tax? Yeah, they, they're happy. Yeah. So what kind of tax is it? You know this. Uh, what kind of tax do they hit you with? Capital gains or ordinary? Yes. No. Ordinary income. Re ordinary income. It's like your, it's like your wages. It's, that's, how, that's how they're taking it out. It's wage, yeah. it's wage um, type taxes, <coughs> right? So it's higher rate. Versus capital gains, if you have brokerage accounts, you know, it's 20 percent-ish. So that's where you pick your different buckets. Do I take it, you know, do I take extra from my IRA or do I take it out of my brokerage account because I can pay capital gain rates? Yes? <coughs> so with an IRA, if you take money out and put it in a Roth or 529s, you pay the taxes then and not, and then the recipient of the 529 doesn't have to pay tax on it. Um, so, Whenever you, t let's take it in first step. Okay, I'm taking money out of my IRA. You pay tax on it. First thing that has to happen yeah. is you have to pay the IRS. What you do with it after that is yeah. totally up to you. You know, it's you, technically you don't pay. If you just go to cash, you're not paying anything. You're not paying any more tax on that unless you're getting interest on it, which I think is now 0.1% mm -hmm. in the banks, right? So, yeah. And then after that, it's whatever you do you with it. You put it in um, Roth or 529 or? Yeah, I mean. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know if, yeah, maybe a Roth, yeah. I don't know if you can even find that. It depends on the age. Yeah. yeah, there are limits. There's always rules. There's so many rules. I can't keep track of them. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that, I've been retired for a while, one of the things in my IRA, which has worked out real well with my broker, I write covered writing out of the money and just let that money just accumulate. And I try to keep my 4 or 5% I take out. It builds up capital. It's one of the few ways you can build money up without speculating. You have good stock like Parker and Gamble. I could name a whole bunch, but uh, you just okay. can write uh, about 80 bucks a share. You do a 90 out of uh, other money for three months. You know, it's all yours. If you call the stock away, you buy another great stock. Okay, so you like to dabble. Ah, <laughs> a little bit. It's, you know what? I, I have a lot of clients who, you know, will handle some of their money. And then they just want a fun. They just want a fun account that they want to dabble with. And it's like you know what? It's it's it's, it's it can be a lot of fun to dabble in the market. There's a lot of things that you can do as an individual investor that I never discourage you from doing. Just be prepared to lose it. That's all, or a good chunk of it, right? I mean, that's you know, my wife has come up with some crazy ideas, and I think we've yielded zero at the end of the day. But she had fun doing it, you know, and she also learned let's not dabble. But that was just you know because we didn't do it right. So you can dabble, and it can be entertaining. It's fun. Um, so if you found a great way, perfect, you know, good way to go. All right, uh, investments, again, is very broad, very important because it's the inflation beater. And this is your main source. This should be your main source of your discretionary um, money that you spend, right? If it's a bad year, you may not want to go to um, on that four-week Hawaiian trip. <coughs> may not be quite in the cards. And again, I don't know your situation. Everybody's situation is different, so... You know, these are just very broad statements that may be helpful. Okay, protecting your home, all right? So um, we should have learned from Steve about the Homestead Act. Did we remember that? Does everybody have a Homestead Act on their house? Yeah. Very simple. Uh, um, you just, you can do it online. Uh, not that you can do it online, but you can pull down the form online. Homestead Act, basically in Massachusetts, Massachusetts specific, is you can protect your home from creditors. You do this Homestead Act on it, and I think it's like $35 to file it, something like that. Um, and basically, it protects the home, so if any creditors come after you, they can't touch your house. They touch everything else, most everything else, but they can't touch your house, right? So it's just a very simple, basic thing to do. If you've changed your mortgage, if you've refinanced, if you've done a HELOC, more than likely your Homestead Act is no longer valid, because any time you change, and an underwriter, any time you change a loan origination, it oftentimes gets rid of the, the uh, thing, so you want to reinstate it. So just, you know, if you don't, get out your Homestead Act if you already have it, look at it, make sure it's looking up to date. If you don't have one, I suggest you get one right away and get it online. Do you go on the Massachusetts.gov website? I don't, I don't know if it's there or not. I would just look up Homestead Act, uh, Homestead Act and you'll find it. Um, okay. Yeah, and if you want to write me afterwards or just send me a note, I'll, I'll, I have copies of it back in my work. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm happy to send it to you. Yes? So, so if you changed your uh, uh, ownership to uh, a trust, would that change? I, I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. That's a very good question. Uh, that would be a good, um, I would double check with your attorney okay. who wrote that to find out for sure. Okay. Um, that's a very good, I just don't know the answer to that question. I think it's because the, um, you know, when you have collateral and you have the banks get involved, they can move a lot of things around for their favor. Mm -hmm. So they would be more compelled. But I think in a trust, I don't think you're going to have an issue with that. But I, th I would double check with your attorney to find out for sure. And that's going to be a note I'm going to ask myself. Um, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> trust issue. Question. Um, mass health lien laws. Anybody ever heard of this? Okay, yeah, so a few people do know. Um, in Massachusetts, if you have a minimum long-term care policy, and I think it's 125 a day for two years um, policy, the state, if you are unfortunate enough to have the state, you end up on mass health. What they do is they do an estate recovery, and they will go after all of your assets after you pass. So anything that was spent to um, take care of you, the state basically puts a lien on your home. But you can prevent that lien simply by getting a long-term care policy. That's a minimum standard, and if you have, I think it's 125 for uh, two years, 125 a day is how they look at it. Um, if you do that, you automatically uh, avoid 
the estate recovery going after your home. They won't go after your home. They can go after everything else, but they can't go after your home. That's actually like a pretty, pretty good thing to know. It's not necessarily terribly expensive, and it's unique to Massachusetts. Very unique. If you're in a nursing home for 10 years, they, and you have a two-year policy, then or whatever. That's all you need is a two-year policy. You just need a two-year long-term care policy. At a minimum, you just need 125 a day. And it, it doesn't matter how long you're in, no matter how big the bill is, they will not touch your house. Protecting your home, right? Another way to protect your home is to have someone who you like, who's a family member, live with you for two years before you need it. And then they'll protect the home as well. Little tricks. But it has to be family. I think it has to be family. I'm almost positive it has to be family. Yes, it does have to be family. Um, and another way, this is kind of a big deal in North Reading. We have people who are overhoused. Does anybody know what overhoused means? You're in a big house. You're, you're in a three, four bedroom house. You know, it's huge. You live alone. And no one else is with you, but you can't afford to sell because you can't afford to go buy it somewhere else, right? I mean, that's like you're an overhoused situation. Um, you know, I, I, I think in North Reading, we're trying to actually change the zoning so that more people are allowed to live in their home and potentially like an in-law rent out a room or something like that. <coughs> you know, if you have the ability to be able to do that, that's a great cash flow way to do it, and it provides a little company, especially if you live alone. It's a big deal to have somebody around, right? So, um, you know, not everybody's up for it, everybody wants their privacy, I get all that, but there's nothing wrong with having somebody there too, especially if you can live in your home. Because to move, you know, even for me to move out, like uh, my home, it sounds great, it sounds like I'm really overhoused, but then when you go to, you know, you go to look at a Pulte property, which is over in Reading, which is now being built in North Reading. Um, after you look at the condo fees and everything else like that, it becomes a wash, and ended up you know going a lot smaller. So, it's uh, it's easy to get stuck in your own home and not have any resources to be able to get them keep it alive. Yes, sir. I think the Boston Globe magazine did something on that maybe two months ago. It was a very interesting article. I think it was somebody in Lincoln who had a big house, and he was allowed to rent out a portion of it and buy an income, and he could stay there. Yeah, I, mean, no, I think it was, a, I know it was a little magazine. It's a big deal. Exactly it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I mean, this is really, you know, for you to be able to stay in your home. Again, what's our, one of the main things we want to do is stay our home as long as we can. It's a huge deal. And everybody wants, you know, the reality is that everybody wants you to stay there because it costs, you know, even if you're sick, they want you to stay in your home because it's the least costly way to go. So everybody wants you to be in your home. So the more you can do to make that happen, the better. It's, and it also you feel better being at home than being anywhere else, right? So if you're not going to feel well, what does everybody want to do? They want to go home. It's our comfort. You know, it's where we want to be. Just very natural. So it's, you know, um, if you have the option, consider it. Again, do it when you don't have a crisis. Um, okay, future housing types and costs. You know, I just like to just, you know, if, you, if this didn't come up during the session that we did or you missed the session, you know, assisted living for a single person is around 70000 a year. If you go to assisted living, if you go to assisted living, it's about seventy thousand dollars a year. If you're a couple, it's about a hundred, maybe a little bit more. Just I'm just giving you big numbers, right? Just so if you're starting to think about this, you can prepare for it. Um, nursing home, of course, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, nursing homes in Massachusetts are slowly losing beds, you know, more and more because people are just not moving into nursing homes. They're just not attractive. But if that were to happen, it's ten to twelve thousand dollars per month. It's really more like fourteen thousand dollars. Per month, I, I forgot to put per month down. It's, it's one hundred forty-four thousand dollars a year, basically. And then um, uh, visiting, you know, I have some people who want to be at home. They want to have visiting nurses come in twenty-four-seven, quarter million dollars a year. Quarter million dollars a year, twenty-four-seven. It's expensive, very, very expensive to have visiting nurses come in. Sounds great. You hope they don't have to. To have very many hours with you. Not necessarily a good alternative. Sounds great. Now, again, if you did the pre work and went to your local senior center, you talked to your geriatric care manager ahead of time, you would have been able to identify some resources maybe early that might be under government, maybe not. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of organizations in Massachusetts. We live in a great state. We have so many, we have so much help on so many different fronts. The hardest part is just figuring out what you can tap into, and you need someone to do that. So, Again, I encourage you to plan for that. And then does anybody know what CCRC is? No. Yes? Continuing Care Retirement Community. Can you name a place locally that is it? Um, probably Brookhaven. Um, there you go. Is one. Yeah, I mean, that's the, most, that's the most common one. That's the one I know. 
Um, and people have been in PVD have seen it. It's, it. There's others that were out, but PVD is where I know. There's one in. There's one down south too. Uh, yeah, it could be. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've lost track of myself a little bit. That's why I need my round table because they know. I don't know. Um, CCRC are is very interesting alternatives because the rule at, at PVD is you put your money in while you're healthy. You have to do it while you're healthy. You can't go in. Can't go in broken down. Not going to work. So you go in healthy. Basically, you're living independent living. You put in three, four hundred thousand dollars. You get yourself an apartment. It can be a very nice apartment. Once you're there, if you need extended help, you can go to your assisted living, you can go to you know uh, memory care units wherever you might end up. But it's all on campus, and then if you're a couple, you know you get to stay there, and it's a walk to go see each other. It's not far away. Um, and once you're in, what happens if your expenses become more and more expensive over time? They charge you rent, but then if it becomes excessive over that number. They will start to work down your three to four hundred thousand dollars until it potentially ends up at zero. After that, no more. They don't. It's it's that's it's like an insurance policy. You won't lose all your money. But if you happen to go there, and you just happen to pass away like everybody else wants to, which is healthy, you just fall asleep. Um, if there's money left behind, you get like ninety percent of it back for your family, so it can pass on. So it's a and you know it's not for everybody, but I have to say I went to PB about six seven years ago with my father in law, and. Um, it's a fantastic facility, and you know the the upside is, uh, you know, really strong. You know, to, to to like be able to stay at a place where you know you're going to stay. You said Brooksby Village. Uh, Brooksby Village. Yeah. What did you? Oh, Brooksby Village. What did you say? I'm sorry. I meant Brooksby Village. My ear. My ear. That's right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Sorry. Thank you. There's a very expensive monthly fee. I, I, you have to have a certain amount of income to get into it. Yeah, yeah, you do have to pay. But the, the point is, is if you can afford that, once you're in, yeah, you're, you're not going to get booted out. Right. So how do you ensure? I mean, I've gotten a lot of fancy advertisements about these places, but how do you ensure that management is going to stay high quality? That's I mean, a, it's uh, like condominiums, you know, the big systems. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Assessments. I agree, it's a concern. My father-in-law who lived in, in Florida, the place they went to, it wasn't a CCRC, but it was uh, independent living, bellied up and they took it over. I think even Brooksby Village, I think, had a change like maybe 10, 12 years ago where they took it over themselves. So, I, you know, it's, I, you have to do your due diligence. Yeah. And again, this is a case where in any of these situations, you gotta do your homework before you need it. <coughs> you gotta really feel good about it. You gotta know all the choices that are out there, have done your homework and feel really good about it because um, you just don't know the future. How do we know a good facility, by the way? This is really an important question. Uh, so, you know, I have a uh, crisis in my family. I gotta place my mom, like, right away. How do I know a good assisted living from not a good assisted living place? You can go on the Medicare website. You can go on the, do they rate it? Uh, um, for nursing homes, they do for compare, like uh, others. Okay, for nursing homes, I get. What about assisted living? When I did it for my mother, I was shopping around um, for nurse staff patient ratios. Very good. Wow, that's very good. Okay, so let me tell you. Oh, that's that's a huge, huge deal. So here's what here's I'm going in, you know, trying to be nice to my mom, trying to be nice to them, and I look in and all I see is the bells and whistles. It's beautiful in here. Oh, that looks beautiful. Wow, nice decorations, everything else like that. Doesn't mean anything. What really matters is the uh, how long has staff been on board. Have they, are, if you drive up on the outside and it says looking for help, keep driving. <laughs> right? I mean, literally think about that. I mean, really, that's what they're telling you is we can't get staff here. If they're advertising out front, more than likely, they do not have a good management system set up to take I care of their staff. I use my nose. I use my nose. Just to smell when you go inside and see what's going on? Okay. <laughs> that's another way because if it's clean, it's not going to smell. I'm sorry, but yeah. I mean, um, where my mother was in Rhode Island, there was absolutely no turnover for assisted living, but another place I went to, there was a lot of turnover. And both of them were assisted living. The one that had the highest turnover, every time we went in the room, it looked like a depress it was depressing, it was all dark. Yeah. Dark, dark, dark. Yeah. And everything was, um, the costs were on the level of care provided. So yeah, so it was, it was uh, nickel and dime month, here. Yeah. If you yeah. need med management this month, if you need home health aid, 
So everything was a different layer yeah. of expenses. Whereas the one she ended up was a fixed rate. Yeah, and, a, and, and most was included, right? Everything yeah. was included. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So laundry, personal care, everything was just one flat rate. Mm -hmm. So the extremes I saw, uh, thank you for that. The, the beautiful one that I saw, as soon as your, your parent had a medical issue, you were out. Mm -hmm. You were gone. And how, does people, how do people feel about like moving in and then moving out again? That's like the last thing you want to do, right? They were very clear. My wife was like, so if we need a doctor, you're going to assist doing that? Oh, no. If they need a doctor, they're out. I mean, it was very clear. That was the Bells and beautiful building, brand new, the whole bit. No services. And then we went to other places that you would say, you know, from the outside, didn't look so great. People staffed 15, 20 years. You know, when my mother-in-law died, they came to the funeral. Oh, wow. yeah. I mean, come on, that's, that's the kind of staff you want. The, the, the presidents, you know, at first we see beautiful, we see ugly. It all kind of blends. It's really the people, the people that matters. So this is, again, when you're doing your homework, this is on the assisted living side especially. Really know what the staff is. Get to know them. Understand what's going on. Don't fall for the bells and whistles. It's really not the real criteria. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Yes? I was just going to say when you go for a tour, um, they usually set you up with someone to have lunch. Go talk to other people, not the that's right. they had that's right. lunch with. Cause See you later. Yeah. Feel. yeah. So go check out other people. But also, one I'll mention is Carlton Willard, which is in Bedford. Um, mm -hmm. 20 plus years, they've had excellent, stable community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then tour, 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 right? Yeah. Go see them all over and over again. Right? <coughs> I just can't recommend Are there any resources that can help you look like? I mean, you've got a, somebody's got a place for mom, something like that. Do they have any? Yeah, see, I, I'm not a huge, that's a national organization. It's a national marketing organization. And they, they um, the, the place for mom, just to understand it, is if, if they place somebody through there, they get like $10,000 from the place they got the thing. So there's like, it's, it's not, I, I, I'm sure it's a great resource if you have nothing else, but it's not the local flavor. It's not those kind of places that have a great reputation. You need to have local resources who know what's going on. A place for mom has Joan London as their spokesman. Of course, we identify with Joan, but that's not the place. That's right, because it's only people who are willing to ante up. You know, I don't know if they're on there, but if you went, it'd be interesting for you to look and see is that provider on a place for mom? Because they may just not want to. They may not have the money to spend for the advertising. They want to spend it on their staff. I know Carl Miller is not. Yeah, that's what I mean. So here's a great place that they just don't see because you're not willing to play the game. And it's, I get the playing the game, but that's not the real issue. Local resources are really important to know. And there's always, you know, uh, it's, there's always local flavors that a national franchise can't pick up on. Good questions. All right, how are we doing? Oh, God, it's quarter after three. All right. Um, state planning, we've kind of covered uh, the trust. I mean, is it irrevocable or not? It depends on your situation. Um, it's situation meaning, are you ready to give up control of that money? <coughs> That's kind of like the big deal with irrevocable trust. And it really requires, you know, when the attorney makes a proposal about how to handle it, you really have to think about what that means for your future. Are you giving up control? Is it, you know, and there's different ways to set up irrevocable trust, so they're not all bad. Some of them are very, very good. It depends on your situation, how it's used. But in general, you don't want to do things through a will. In general, you want to do things through, um, you want to do things through a trust, mm -hmm. and you want to have all your documents lined up, your advanced <laughs> directives. You don't want your family <laughs> arguing about what to do with you if you're incapacitated, and you can't think about what's going on. You want to do it ahead of time. I had a huge fight with my mom. She fell, fractured her pelvic bone in three places. Mm -hmm. She, you know, I guess what happens is when you have that kind of trauma, chemicals surge to your brain. You, you know, you just, you get stressed out beyond belief. So I'm, she lives 100 miles away. I'm getting a call at 2 o'clock in the morning. We have to put your mom on the street because she won't sign the release form. She's gone paranoid, you know. So I got to fly out. You know, I'm driving out at 4 o'clock in the morning and convince them. I had to have a screaming match with her for like hours to get her to finally sign. What do we learn from this? Should have been done long before we got in that situation. I mean, it was really so unnecessary. I mean, my parents are the case study for poor planners. Absolute poor planners. I mean, it breaks my heart that that should happen. But I mean, and so I have experience. You know, I had that stress with my mom. We never recovered from that argument, never got over it. Um, and then my dad, same thing. You know, he just never planned, never planned. And so when he's passing, he passed in April, 
when he's passing, instead of me like just holding his hand and getting to know him again, because we know he's going to pass, you know, I spent all my time running around doing logistics. You know, so I had 10 minutes before he died to like say goodbye. That was it. You know, that's, that's not fair. So plan ahead. You know, that's, that's all I can tell you. I'm going to skip real quick. Role of long-term care insurance. I already gave you the lien law information. There's lots of different uh, long-term care policies out there. In general, you have to be healthy to get them. They don't sign up people who are already unhealthy. It doesn't work out that way. But if you're at all healthy and that's of interest, they can be expensive. But they do have their role, especially in Massachusetts. A role of life insurance if you have a lot of assets. <coughs> Less so than before because the tax rules have changed at least through 2025. You know, in, um, in, the, in the IRS world, federal government world, if you are a couple, anything over $22 million, they can tax you on. Probably that doesn't include almost anybody I know, so we almost don't have to worry about that. But in, in Massachusetts, anything over a million dollars does get taxed. So Massachusetts estate tax can actually be quite imposing. It can go up to like 16% of that amount. So that would be one reason why you would use life insurance besides um, uh, for just estate equalization if you're doing a estate plan. Million is applicable only to life insurance policy? No, no. Uh, a, a total, <coughs> if, they, if, if you were to pass and all your assets were on the table, how much is left? And if you had anything over a million dollars, including your home, anything over a million dollars, this Massachusetts is going to tax on anything over a million dollars from dollar one. So you get a $1 million exemption, but if you go over a million dollars, they're gonna go back. So as soon as you hit a million dollars and one, you're paying $40,000 tax, and then it escalates from there. So it starts at like 0.4% and goes up to 16%. <coughs> Massachusetts has a very low level. Okay, and then um, again, we're running out of time. Uh, you know, cognitive abilities, um, you know, as we, over time, our capacity diminishes. I asked this question at the beginning, do you have someone in your family you can trust? If you don't, especially get someone online with your essential docs who's gonna help you with your finances, help you get through that. There are DMMs, which I put at the bottom, which is F, daily money managers. There's people who can help you do your checking accounts, your billing, everything else like that. Um, those are like the 60, $75 an hour to help you Get your accounts in order so you don't have to worry about your bills all the time. Can be very handy to use. What's that? Oh, um, and you know to avoid. Um, you always want to have two eyes on the prize, so you always want to have two sets of eyes. So, like in my family, we have five kids in the family. My sister and I, we're always reviewing each other's stuff. I do parts of it. She does parts of it. What I do is transparent to her. What she does is transparent to me. You always want to have two sets of eyes on everything that's going on. That's a really huge top level rule. It's not good to put it in one person's control without somebody else at least being able to see what's going on, right? Just heard about a profit share, a profit share, a, a nonprofit company, $1.2 million embezzled. Why did it happen? Two reasons, they never cleaned up their books annually. And the second reason only one person was touching the books. And then when they ran out of, when they closed their, their doors because they couldn't afford it anymore, they came back and discovered there was $1.2 million of embezzlement going on over the years. I mean, it's just because they didn't do the two eyes. You know, you gotta have two sets of eyes. All right, um, and then a lot of you already found financial advisors. I'm not even gonna spend time doing that. So it's just, uh, I'm happy to answer that question, but it's just not important. So um, uh, I'm not going to get to uh, legacy. Uh, grandkids versus kids, a lot of the rules have changed. So they're, they're called a generation skipping tax. So when you get with an estate attorney, you're gonna find this is less compelling than it used to be. It's just a matter of how much tax you pay. So it's lesser of an issue, that's really all I can say about it. And then on the estate uh, review periods, I think you should be reviewing your, your docs. Um, every, Massachusetts especially, when we talk about um, healthcare proxies, uh, things that are medical, Doctors are very resistant to honor them. So I think those should be reviewed almost every other year, every three years, because they want to see a fresh doc when you walk in there and try to use it. Um, when it comes to your estate planning, unless you've had some sort of big life transition or you know someone's got divorced, <coughs> whatever, um, I suggest that you, um, is that you review it every five years. Just check it. I know how it's done. I think it's really important to do it every five years. 10 years, whenever somebody tells me I did my will 10 years ago, it's almost I can go through it very quickly and go, 
who's a beneficiary? Oh, it's this person, and we look, and it's like, no, it's not, because things change. Just things change over time, you can't help it. If nothing else, at least look at the document yourself. Find the document every five years, yeah. and then look at it. <laughs> Find it first, right? Uh -huh. And then look at it, and see if, uh, see if it still makes sense, if it still makes sense to you, what, what you're going for, okay? Um, last thing I will leave you with is, uh, you showed up today, so I'm going to put you in the category of people who actually care mm -hmm. and want to do yes. something, right? So I'm writing an article. I started touching on this. Uh, it's called uh, Feeling Lucky, Go to Vegas. Everyone else, you need a plan, right? <laughs> so it's really true. When you think about it, you know, a lot of people live their lives kind of just, you know, I'm going along, I'm doing my thing, not really planning. You know, and for some people, that works out great. They have a great life. But for a majority of people, that really doesn't really work out very well at all. So if, you, if you're a caring person and you care about your family, you care about yourself, making a plan ahead is like a really, really a big deal. And again, I touched on it. Without a plan, the time we need our family to be emotionally connected to us, if they're running around doing logistics, we all get robbed of that experience. That's a very, very important time of our life. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, I'll write this article. If anybody wants to get this when I'm done, I'd be happy to send it to you. Put it at the bottom of your survey and just asterisk and I'll know to send you some stuff that I can follow up with afterwards but again do it while you're while you're able you know don't don't make it overwhelming do it all in one month set up little objectives for yourself plan your future you know um, does anybody know who said this the best way to predict your future is to um, is to plan for it does anybody know who said that oh it's to create it I'm sorry I miss said I miss said it wrong the best way to create your future is to um, why am I messing this up it's, hold on the best way to predict your future is to create it. Does anybody know who said that? Abe Lincoln. Those are great words. I love those words. I don't have to be better about reciting them right off. But those are great words. If you want to know your future, create it. You know, be proactive, right? So that's my encouragement to all of you. Okay? So I'll stop here. Um, any questions that we haven't already asked? That, or we can take them offline if you'd like. Yes? I'm sorry. It was on the um, syllabus, the in writing rule under cognitive abilities, financial abuse, and scams. Okay, so we're going back to uh, uh, 12. Kind of, yep, yep, 12 and then in writing rule. Oh, uh, what did I mean by that? I think I meant. <laughs> uh, hold on. Oh, I know. Uh, if someone calls you up and says, I have a great deal for you. Oh. What's the best way to clean it up? I always, you know, people say, oh, I got this deal, you got to get this deal. No. I want it in writing. Yeah, hey, sounds great. I agree with you. Sounds great. I want to get them off the phone. Sounds great. Put it in writing. Oh, well, we don't do that. Okay, okay well, I don't, I don't do that over the phone. Send it to me in writing, I'll be happy to consider it. If you're not going to put it in writing, I'm not going to do it. That's simple. That's what it is. Sorry, I had to think. I was out of sequence. Perfect. Good question. Dean, do not call. Oh, so I, we get calls all the time to do not call list. And then the other one is if you're getting the robo calls, this is very good to know, uh, is nomorobo.com. Don't you have to pay for that I, If it is, it's new. I thought it was free. I thought you had to pay because I looked at it. Okay, but it's nomorobo.com. And that will keep the <laughs> robo callers off of your phones list, which are very irritating. Yes? Would that eliminate calls from, the, from your municipality? Uh, no, I think that's a whole other system. And, and it won't eliminate the president uh, uh, emergency right, right. trust yesterday at 218. You can't eliminate that one either. You can't get out of that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. The only thing I can say is probably like everybody in this room, I get so many calls a week, it's crazy. But the best one that I come up with, you get a phone call, somebody's talking about a brand new credit card, it's going to pay an interest to do all this. Uh, I say, to them, gee, I'm kind of busy right now. Can I take your phone, call you back? They almost all hang out. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're so compelled, that doesn't mean you got off their list, though. So sometimes I stay on the list and I'm always like, I, I, I get to the point where I answer that question and I go all the way through and say, okay, now I want you to take me off the list. And they, they're technically supposed to do that. That doesn't always happen. And there was somebody who just got a huge fine for like being very aggressive in their telemarketing. I forgot where I heard it, but. Literally got a huge, huge, I mean, $12 million or something, wow. really substantial. I do, do not block on my, if I get one call like, on my cell phone, I do, do not oh, block perfect. the Oh, perfect. That's call. a great idea. Yeah. And same for email, too. When you get the junk email, you can always do the block, yeah. up, right? Yeah. Get them out.
Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. I hope you learned something. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. That's I hope you enjoyed great. our series. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, we'll be at Lexington again if you think this was so engaging. I'd be happy to do it again. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.